start recording again. So the way I thought we'd structure this time together, our last um, moments together, is for me to go over some administrative stuff to remind you just of due dates and so on, also to discuss again the assessment deposit um, that has to be made by everybody of their term paper. And then after that, I'll go through with you um, the basically the prep sheet for the final exam, like what's what's going to be on the final exam, what are the topics covered by the final exam, and so on. And then um, with the time that remains after that, I thought we could just go through a few selected um, examples. There's not going to be time to go over everything, but I, I think maybe just a few things here and there that, um, especially a few things maybe that we had to go over a little bit more quickly. Um, Maybe we can just turn back and, and look at them again. So with that um, in mind, it's going to maybe be a little bit choppy with the examples. We'll jump between chapters 12, 13, and 14. Um, and, you know, if if you're not completely ready to hear some of the stuff today, remember the lecture is being recorded. So um, if you need to listen to it again while you're studying, then, you know, you have that you have that option which maybe is, you know, going to be a good option for, for some people who maybe are, are a little bit, um, you know, I guess still in the mode of, of getting ready to prepare for the, for the final. So I guess before I even start talking about anything um, as it relates to deadlines, I just want to remind you again that the final exam is, is weighted, the, you know, it's the same percentage as the other tests and that's because it's just on the last three chapters it's not a comprehensive um final for the whole uh semester which i mean there was no way we were doing that it was just going to be way too much work so it's 15 percent of your grade um the research paper is also 15 percent the other 10 percent that's still um you know up in the air is uh the e-portfolio um you know, you you still have time to finish the work. I'll go over that deadline again. I'm hoping that everybody will get as close to the full 10% as possible. Then the other um, piece of work that is, is still um, open is the chapter 14 homework that's due today. That's another 3% of your grade. Um, I'll go for the first thing that we do when we go over examples, I'll actually go th through one or two of the chapter 14 homework examples just to remind us of some concepts. So um, they are, you know, they are still things, yeah, between the e-portfolio, the um, homework that's still available for today, that's 13%, and the final exam is another 15%. So that's 28%, that's more than a quarter of the grade of the class that is still available um, to be, you know, to for you to get. So uh, just bear that in mind, yeah, as we go through our last few, you know, days together as you guys do the final and so on. Um, right. So, so that's the that's the great waiting reminder. I also just wanted to let me see uh, if I yeah I remember I did put this up for us over here. Just a reminder again that by tomorrow midnight, you do have an hour today with Raphael. So please attend there and fix anything that needs to be fixed and check with him if he can see all your pages and that they look right. Because remember, what you see when you work on your ePortfolio is not necessarily the same as what I see. So you can choose the published view as opposed to the edi editing view at the end to make sure that when you scroll through the ePortfolio that everything is visible um, to, you know, to the reader. My plan is on Friday to go through the ePortfolio and you know assign grades for all the sections of work I will um if it's a major section that has a lot of points and I can't see it on your ePortfolio, again, I repeat, if it's a major section of work with a lot of points assigned to it and I can't see that you did the work, I will contact you to ask you, you know, if you published that module or whatever, just to make sure that people don't lose um, points 
unnecessarily, but it's your responsibility between today and tomorrow to please just make sure that all your work is published. If I contact you and I don't hear back from you, um, then I'm going to assume that that work wasn't done because there's no way that I can see, um, you know, something that's not published. So please uh, check your email in the coming days to make sure that there's no um, emails from me. If it becomes very serious, I may even text you, um, you know, just to make sure again that people are not losing points. So the the that doesn't mean that you don't do the work by tomorrow, right? The 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 deadline is tomorrow. I'm not talking about contacting you to say, please do this work. I'm talking about contacting you to say, I can't see this work. Um, did you do it? And then if the answer is no, that's the end of it. But I'm I'm not contacting you to give you an extension. I'm just contacting you to, to make sure that the work was actually published. Because I think at least with one person, Gion, I know you had this weird problem where your work was disappearing. So um, we need to make sure by tomorrow that everybody's stuff is visible and um, that I can see it on Friday. And again, I'll contact you if there's something really very wrong and I suspect that you did do the work, but I don't see it, okay? Um, does anybody have questions about that or about the grade weighting that I discussed? Okay. So, um, Today, obviously the review, but I also just want to remind you, I don't think this really applies to anybody in this class, but just in case something goes haywire somewhere and you feel like you need to withdraw from a course, um, your last day to withdraw from any course is today, December the 8th. Um, so, you know, bear that in mind by midnight, um, that's when that's when the, the last day to withdraw is, is happening. Um, or the last minute to withdraw is happening. If you have a concern about this class and for some reason think that you may need to withdraw from this class or something to do with your grade in the class, um, please feel free to email me or to stick around at the end if you need to talk about it, all right? So don't um, just disappear or don't, um, you know, assume anything, talk to me before you do anything. Um, and then I already said this on Monday, I'll say it again, that the final exam opens tomorrow and it close at, at nine and it closes on Thursday. I mean, sorry, it opens tomorrow, which is Thursday, sorry, at 9 a.m. And it closes on Monday at 6 p.m. All right. So again, questions about anything to do with the dates. Now is the time to ask. Professor. Yeah, I cannot hear you so well. Yes, hi. Hello? Yeah. Can you hear ahead. me now? Yes, much better. Mm -hmm. uh, so the due date for all the e-portfolio assignment is tomorrow by 12? Mm -hmm. all right. Yeah, I mean, most of the stuff you've already did. It's kind of just like your final sweep through to make sure that you did everything. Okay, thank you, Professor. No problem. What else? Anybody else? And Eric, I'll just remind you guys that if you want to do a cross check whether you actually did everything, go to the syllabus and grade weighting tab, click on this reg hour syllabus. This is the syllabus for the ePortfolio. And you can start scrolling through and you see, you know, what was assigned for every date. And you can kind of just use it like a checklist to make sure that you actually did everything. All right. If you don't have, I mean, you guys have had access to the syllabus throughout the semester, but you may um, not have it handy, just use this. So for instance, um, you know, when we had uh, Professor Maharaj coming to speak to the class uh, about effective communication, maybe you were there, but you forgot to do your summary of the points that you uh, took away from that discussion. And if you, you know, if you, don't remember your points or something I had also sent out and I think it was in the announcements which you guys can also which you guys also have access to I sent out um, an email you, you also have this in your email an email with her um, with her notes of what she said yeah Professor Maharaj's notes so I'm, I'm, I mean that's just as an example of of something that you know someone might realize like oh no I didn't do this but I I meant to do it and I forgot or someone forgot to 
to write, you know, some some essay or something. If you if you are sitting there today and um, you are trying to write stuff up and you realize that you don't know where something needs to go, um, just email me to ask me. Or better yet, like I said, you have the class at one o'clock. Just speak to Raphael and make sure that you are. Um, up to speed with where you're putting your stuff, like uploading a resume. No one should be losing the 10 points for uploading the resume. I mean, you guys probably have resumes, most of you work. So just make sure that it's there and that it's actually published. I'm gonna go through using this document through each person's ePortfolio. Well, I mean, I'll have a, a, like a grading sheet, but it's based on the points on this document through each person's ePortfolio and checking whether they've done the work. And for the most part, unless you've written in like one sentence instead of you know an essay or something most people will get full uh, points unless you really haven't answered the question um but if there's nothing there i can't i mean i can't grade what's not there so please uh, be aware of that and there's also three points of your e-portfolio grade attached to actually uploading your term research paper in the assessment area so um many people have done that already but I, I just want to um, show show again, I think I this is what I see. So I can see who has and hasn't done it. And yeah, you I have waiting for students. So there's people in this class who still haven't uploaded their term research paper. Remember, I sent an announcement um, after last times class when Antora was asking how to deposit the term paper, I sent the link to the video where David is explaining in the last 30 minutes of the class how to do it, and also another link to just a regular document that gives you step by step how to do it. So if you're one of those people who hasn't um, submitted your term paper yet, please do so. Um, and like I said, I mean, it's it's not a lot of points, but this this is the difference between an A minus and an A right on the e-portfolio so and it's something so quick and simple to do so please make sure that you um deposit the the term paper into the assessment area as well i will be looking for that um on friday also as part of my check of of the e-portfolio work all right so any other questions about the e-portfolio um completing the work Remember, this is ten percent of your grade, so um, you know it's it's significant. So, ask away if there's anything else that anyone wants to know. Okay, so. Um, also, just maybe just the last point I'll make is um, just read through what you've written, if you can, if you have the time as you fix your, your e-portfolio or add things, just make sure that any obvious grammar errors and things or, or spelling errors that you fix those. Um, I, I will just, I'm, I'm just reading, you know, I know that things are in your voice. I'm not, this is not an English class where I'm trying to correct grammar and spelling, but sometimes, you know, things can be hard to follow if, if the spelling or grammar is really, um, you know, a little bit problematic. So again, just, just check your work um, to make sure that you've proofread what you, what you've done on the portfolio okay so that's the portfolio again that's um something that's due you know tomorrow the homework for chapter 14 due later today i know that the last week of class is always brutal right or the last two weeks you guys probably have a whole lot of other things due as well um i get it uh i will just say that you know we've these are not new deadlines, let me put it that way. So unfortunately, I have to stick to the script, these deadlines, you know, we've been going over this since the beginning of the semester. So um, I understand that it's a, it's a tough time. Um, and, and, you know, that it may be difficult to finish everything. I do, I do respect that. And um, I'm hoping that with my support, if you need help with something that you'll still be able to make make the deadlines. If it's proving to be difficult, please contact me. Um, all right, so that's that's that. Now let's uh, switch over here to um, 
what's happening on the on the final exam. Um, I put the the information, <clears throat> you know, pasted into uh, Blackboard, but also um, in a Word doc because the the formatting always goes a little bit crazy when I go into some, or sometimes when I paste stuff into Blackboard. So I'm just going to stop the share for a second and just pull up my. Word document. Um, I think it's a little bit easier to follow that. Just one, just one minute. All right. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Make us a little bit bigger here. Yeah. I just want to send on. Okay, I guess I'll go in Zoom automatically. All right, <clears throat> so this is all on Blackboard under the test and quiz information um, tab. But because I lost some of the formatting here, I tried to fix it again, but it, it, it can't really be fixed. If you if the formatting bothers you, just download the, the Word document. I'm just going to work off this Word document here for a second. So we already know most of this uh, in terms of when the exam is happening, but I'll just repeat that it will be available in Connect starting tomorrow um, at 9 a.m. If anybody is so moved that they feel they want to take the exam earlier than that, uh, you know, you want to take it tomorrow and you have to take it early, I can open it uh, earlier than 9 a.m., I don't mind. And ending Monday, December the 13th at um, 6 p.m. I'm sure most people are testing, you know, this week. So uh, you have a few days, about five days, to decide when you want to take the exam. The exam counts 15% of your grade for this class. We already discussed that. I can't give deadline um, extensions or make up exams without a valid documented excuse, you know. So, you know, again, talk to me, but you have to talk to me before the fact, and you have to actually have a valid excuse. Um, since there's a five-day window that you can take it, you know, so um, please don't contact me on Monday to tell me that you now are not able to take the exam unless something significant actually was happening, you know, um, it's difficult at that point to try and, and suss out what exactly is going on. Um, so five days, you choose when you want to do it. You know the setup already. It's the same like what we had for the tests. Yesterday, there was like, I'm sure you guys, or maybe you guys were affected. I don't know. I was affected because I work on Wiley Plus and also on McGraw Hill. Yesterday, there was a massive Amazon Web Services outage in the Northeast, and it affected so many platforms, including the publisher. Um, I don't know if anybody... Uh, saw that, but um, I guess what I will say is that, that that's a very rare occurrence, but if something like that does happen, um, you know, I get notifications automatically. If it happens again, I will know, and at that point, I would put an extension onto the deadline. Um, it was very weird. It was about six hours yesterday that we just that everything was kind of just hanging because um, AWS was was having a, a some type of catastrophic outage. Um, sorry, I don't know why this is both. Of, I think it's because it, I did it with a test in the quiz. Um, the assignment. Uh, please note that the assignment is timed. I'll fix this in the in the other one as well. You know this already. I I haven't been able to pinpoint you. I think you guys know better than me. It seems that you can go in after the first attempt and still have the clock running based on the time that you had before. But um, you know, plan to to complete the the test within, you know, that window. I don't want you to try and start today and come back tomorrow and then we can't get you back into the test or something. Um, you know, that's that's the that's the issue that I would then have to contact, you know, the Wiley rep and and try and and fix that. Ach, not Wiley, the McGraw Hill rep. Um, sorry, I've been so busy with the Wiley rep over the past few days that I'm I'm mixing them up. So 
the the clock keeps ticking. I think to some extent, I know people have been able to go in to do another attempt and they still had time left, but I don't know how much time they had used at that point. So please just watch the time and make sure you have the bandwidth that you need, that you have the computer that you need, that it's charged, um, you know, all those things. If you have a computer issue, yeah, last minutes. Remember that um, LaGuardia does have Dell computers that they loan out to students. Um, so you can also get a computer to a laptop to do your work if, if need be. Um, same as before, three attempts on the exam questions. Um, and if you do one attempt and go back in, remember the system is a little bit strange. It kind of just takes points off across the board. So I had reduced the point. Um, penalty to only 4%, um, and then you can still go in and try and fix things that um, that you want to, to fix, right? So um, that's the same as before. Um, the, the final exam um, conditions, I don't change, you know, for, it's not suddenly one attempt or something like that. It's, it's the same. Um, there will be multiple choice questions, most likely 10 multiple choice questions. Um, remember, it's chapters 12, 13, and 14, so it's, that's what the multiple choice questions will be based on. It's a mix, as usual, of theory, so what people sometimes refer to as definitions, but theory where the answer is not a number or a journal entry or something like that, and also calculations. So most of the time, I try to... Um, focus the multiple choice questions on topics that uh, were not deeply delved into in the exercises. So, you know, if if something is, is an exercise on the exam, I'm less likely to have that exact same thing come up as a multiple choice. Um, I'm more likely to try and include a topic that has not been uh, dealt with in an exercise, um, you know, sorry, uh, in the um, in the multiple choice. I this I was uh, doing this prep sheet for you guys uh, fairly late last night, so I'm as I'm even though I read it, I'm also finding things that I need to edit. Um, so um, I'm doing that as I'm going along. <laughs> and I'll give the updated document, uh, I'll put it into Blackboard. So chapter 12, oh, hopefully it's not too long ago, chapter 12 investments, right? What's, what's the deal there? If you think back, right, way back to chapter 12, we had debt investments and we had equity investments. And um, under debt investments, we had, and I don't know if it helps to, to show you that I, I did a list of, of topics covered, right? I don't know if this is helpful or, or you know, overwhelming, but under debt investments, we had three types of investments, how to maturity, trading, and available for sale, and went through all the different types of uh, journal entries around that. But what I'm going to give you in an exercise is a how to maturity debt investment all the journal entries and the calculations related to that. So the purchase of the debt, the amortization table, um, the interest revenue calculation and the discount or premium amortization um, using the effective interest rate method. And this is basically, it's like the first thing we did in chapter 12. And if people need me to go through today, I can try to um, put you know, the, the questions that are similar uh, year for you, but you, you've had this in your homework for chapter 13, and I'll also just show you, um, no, this is not, sorry, chapter 12, yeah, chapter 12, um, I'll just show you, so basically from the first question that we did for the chapter 12 past work, that's a how to maturity um, debt investment, and this is basically what I'm talking about, right? Recording the purchase of the investment, doing the amortization table, or a few lines of the amortization table, and then um, doing the interest revenue. So you can use this question as kind of a, a reference for what it is that I'm referring to. Does anybody uh, have a comment or question on this? I know it's a lot of information to take in, but I, I feel 
that it's necessary to make sure that I, I'm explaining to you which questions are going to come in. So anybody have a question on what I mean here? Professor? Right. Yes, Professor? I'm listening. Yeah, can you please show me the previous page for the uh, example chapter 12? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so chapter 12, debt investments number one. The first, the basically the first question that we ever answered um, in chapter 12, that's, that's the type of question that I'm referring to. Mm -hmm. I see, thank and you. Number three is, is also a question like that. That's why I said if, if people want me to go through and, and note which ones are, are the ones to focus on, number three is also one. And then there were also questions in your homework um, for how to maturity debt investments. I see, thank you. Okay, no problem. Other questions, yeah? Okay, so that's that would be the first exercise, right? Then, and it's, I mean, the exercises are coming from either the, the textbook or, or the, you know, the generated questions in McGraw-Hill. So you're just doing it in the system. So it's gonna be very similar to what you were doing before where they're asking you for a series of journal entries and maybe calculating the amortization table and so on. The second question under investments is going to be what we call fair value through net income. So it's an, you're invested in a company and you own less than, 20% of the company, and you will have to record the journal entries for the purchase of the investment for any revenue that you uh, earn. So in this case, only dividends would be recorded, a fair value adjustment, um, and any sale of the investment. Right. So, so this um, equity investment question, this exercise, let me move this away. Yeah. Go. Over here. Now I'm in the equity investment handout. Right. So this one, number five, is an example of this, except that they already, um, let me see if they give dividends. Yeah, the only thing is that there's no dividend here, but there are other examples that have dividends. So number five is also similar to a question you had for homework anyway. Um, and that's what I'm talking about. Let me see if there's another one. So that one's probably good. And then, yeah. Over here in number 12, where they do situation one, where you, own 10%, that's another um, example of fair value through net income. And then oh, more questions as well. I'll see if I can't just take 10 minutes at the end of um, at the end of the day today to just attach uh, the question numbers and the homework numbers to these to these uh, exercises so you know what to look for. Anybody have a follow-up question there? I don't want to go too slow here. I mean, I'm not hearing from anybody, so I don't want to waste your time if you're you know, familiar with what I'm talking about. But if you do have a question, just stop me at any time. And then the last piece that, and you'll probably remember this from chapter 12, we also had investments that were um, 20, 20 to 50%, so significant influence, um, equity method investment, that investment in equity affiliate as they, uh, you know, the terminology that they use in, in the book. So we did do a number of examples with this. They were, you know, in, and we went through kind of all the journal entries, you know, the purchase of the investment, the recording of the investment revenue, receiving dividends, and even calculating an investment ending balance. So that will also be part of, of the exercises for chapter 12. And if you look at our listing of um, exercises, number 10 is like that. So is number 11. This is in chapter 12. And so is... Uh, Number 12, situation two, all right? They're all equity method uh, questions. And remember the solutions for all this stuff is already either in the, um, in the classwork, the Google doc, or in a separate document on Blackboard. 
So that's the equity method investment, right? You have to work through these different um, journal entries for that type of investment. And so those are the exercises for chapter 12 that we, you know, that we'll deal with in the exam. Now we'll turn to chapter 13, which is the current liabilities and contingencies. Remember here, yeah, we did a lot of work on different types of notes payable and accounts payable and accrued liabilities and so on. So um, there, were, there are many topics in that chapter. Uh, if you look back at, you know, at the, here we go, yeah. If you look back at the, at the topics they went right up to 13, right, for, for the current liabilities, and then you still had all the contingencies and unasserted claims and so on. So there's a lot going on there. So I really tried very hard to narrow the exercises down to just a, a tiny selection of, of what we have been doing. So the, the first exercise will be something that I think most people are going to be comfortable with. It's just the issuance of a note and then calculating interest on it, just regular interest, the interest accrual, and then the repayment of the note at maturity. Um, and again, if you are concerned that you're not sure, you know what that means, I'll go here yeah, in chapter 13 to the questions. I'm literally talking about something like this, okay? This is the first question that we did. So the company borrows money, they sign a note. It's not necessary, it's not, this is not long-term debt like bonds and stuff. They sign some nine month note or three month note or 12 month note or whatever. And you're asked to journalize, right? The borrowing, the issuance of the note, the payment of um, interest, or just the accrual of interest and then the repayment of the note and the interest at the end. Okay, so those are that or that is the, the type of question that I'm talking about. Okay, and again, you had examples also in your homework. And we've, you know, these are, this is, I think this type of interest calculation and so on is, is pretty straightforward for us. Then I do have to do something on contingent liabilities. And um, this is where I'm gonna test if you understand that they are basically three conditions uh, that you have to look at to see whether contingent liability needs to be recorded or whether it should just be disclosed or whether there is nothing to do. And so I'm talking about, um, you know, just to go back into 13, I'm talking about the work that we did over here, right, with contingent liabilities. And looking at, um, you know, at the, the various ex uh, exercises that were open to me, um, it's basically just the question just giving you scenarios about things that the, you know, the company potential liabilities that the company has. And your job is to say, you know, do we need a journal entry or not, right? And um, remember, you only need a journal entry when it is probable that the, whatever the event or the situation is that will give rise to the liability, it's probable that it's going to happen probable or, you know, or more, like if someone says it's virtually certain or it's highly likely or something, that means that it's probable and that there's an actual amount that can be estimated. That's when you make a journal entry. Other than that, you don't make a journal entry. All right, so this is, this is where you, and I, I don't know if I wrote this, yeah, know that a journal entry is only made excuse me, when it's probable and reasonably estimated, when it's reasonably possible, right? That's, that's the other type of, of language that we use here. You see that reasonably possible, right? When it's reasonably possible, you only disclose it in the um, financial statements. So you put it in the footnotes. You don't make a journal entry. Even if you can estimate the amount, it doesn't matter. You don't make a journal entry. It has to be both of these things. It has to be probable that it's going to happen and, right? And 
the amount can be estimated. So if it's reasonably possible and you can estimate the amount, no journal entry, just a disclosure. And then if it's remote, meaning that it's just not going to happen. Remember we went through this, it's remote. Remote means that it's highly unlikely that something's gonna happen. You know that you don't journalize or disclose anything. So this question is, this uh, exercise is basically just gonna give you, you know, a scenario and say, you know, the company, let's say the company is being sued and the lawyer said that it's, you know, highly likely that they'll have to pay 2 million or, uh, you know, it's after the year already ended and they, they did pay the amount. So then you know that for the financial statements, you actually have to record um, the journal entry because it's subsequent events or something like that. So questions here on the contingent liabilities. Okay, so... So then I'm, I'm struggling a little bit and I haven't completely finished this part because there's other like small topics in this chapter that aren't, they're not huge topics, but they're still kind of important um, topics. So things like deferred revenue and refundable deposits, we did examples on that, um, I'll show you. I'm, I'm just trying to see, you know, how to not overburden the exercises with too many things, but also making sure that I'm asked, like doing what I need to. So for, for instance, this question number five over here in chapter 13 would be an example of deferred revenue. Um, and well, it's, it's also, I guess it's, yeah, deferred revenue and it's a refundable deposit in a way because we receive money from the customer uh, before we even deliver the goods, right? And we and we answered this question together. So that's one of the you know one of the topics that uh, could come in as a. It's basically like one journal entry, and you move on to to the next thing. Compensated absences. This was when we did work on you know people are are earning their days off, but the company you know isn't or people are not taking their days off. So the company has to actually um, account for that and create a liability. And so um, I'm just trying to see where this is. Just one second. Yeah, so for instance, number 17, we did this together. It looks very long, but it's actually quite um, straightforward in the end. This is an example of a compensated absence. And then um, we also had another example of compensated absences over here, this paid vacation question. And then uh, number 22, uh, you know, that the company pays their employees paid vacation and this is how much they've earned. And so you basically debit salaries and wages expense and credit a liability for compensated absences. That's the, that's the journal entry. And we also had one or two questions on sales tax. So that's a advanced collection right, uh, it falls under kind of the same as, as deferred revenue, they're, they're all advanced collections, and we also had pay, a payroll tax um, question, so let me just show you again, the sales tax stuff, uh, well, I, I can show you both uh, fairly quickly, yeah, let's see what's happened there, all right, so let me go back up, So here's the payroll question. Um, I'm not sure that the question that that I've seen there that I've probably put in is as long as this with you doing the uh, calculations and, and the question may or may not even make it into the final cut. I have to see how long the exam is gonna be if I include the stuff. I'm giving you the possibility that, you know, these topics for this particular thing that these topics will be covered. Um, I'm still, you know, making sure that I don't make the test too long. There's a sales tax question. This is also a sales tax question, six and seven. And then it was 15, I believe, sorry, I went past it again. 15 was a um, payroll question. So I'll repeat here what I'm saying with, with these topics, right? 
it's it's short questions or or an item on on you know the this topic i'm trying to see if i sh if i'm going to these are all the, the possibility of everything that could be included i may you know remove something and make it a multiple choice instead because the exam is getting too long but i i don't want to put uh, i don't want to take things off now and put them in the test later and people are not prepared for them does anybody have questions on this um this portion that I just discussed. All right, and then the last one is the work that we just did um, with chapter 14, the issuance of the bonds. Um, this is basically, I can tell you a question the question that is exactly like this, did I not open? Yeah, okay, I thought I didn't open chapter 14 there for a second. The question for your test will be like number three, the Bradford Company. Um, so we did this together the other day. Basically what you asked to do first is calculate the price of the bond based on using those present value tables. And then you're gonna record the journal entry for the issuance of the bond, prepare the journal entry to record interest. And, um, you know, I guess that's that's it. So, so there's also the amortization table, but unlike the um, investment side in chapter 12, this is the, this is the, payables, right? The liability side of, of things. So that's, that's the listing of exercises. Any questions on, um, on this one? Good, a question. Oh, you're saying you're good, okay. <laughs> All right. Any other, anybody else with a question or anything that's not clear? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, again, I'm, I'm walking a fine line between trying to, you know, hold to testing the work, but also not making the test too long. But I'm sure you all see, because I mean, you're going to study this or you have been studying. There's so many topics and many of them are, are very important. I have to make sure that I'm preparing you to go, you know, to the next stage of your of your studies. And so it's difficult. Um, it's, it's, you know, somewhat difficult to to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm not overwhelming you guys. All right. So what I did here, and I, like I said, I don't know if, if this is for better or worse, let's put it that way. I put down all the topics, um, that we discussed and did work on in every chapter and and not to to make people you know um feel like they are overwhelmed but more to just say hey you know when you're studying and maybe you focus so much on the exercises that are gonna come in make sure that you also remember you know some something to do with fair value adjustments for debt investments or whatever have you actually you know tested yourself to to make sure you understand that topic um, so i listed again for 13 also all the different topics that we had like for instance you saw now that warranties and guarantees i didn't put in as an exercise but that would be like a classic example of something that could come up as a multiple choice question because i i just don't have the room to to put everything as an exercise right bonds um, and long-term notes, chapter 14, installment notes, I didn't put in um, as an exercise because it was becoming too many exercises, but that is something that we did cover together. So that is potentially um, a, a multiple choice question. And also this early extinguishment of debt where you sell um, your, your uh, bond before maturity that is also you know, a, a possibility for a multiple choice. So again, those are, those, those are the, maybe the topics that didn't make the cut for exercises, but they certainly are not, um, they're not irrelevant or unimportant. Uh, they will just come up in other ways. 
questions, comments, concerns, let 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 talk. I'll I'll let you take a minute to process and simmer and and then um, maybe just ask me anything you want to ask and and then we'll maybe take a break and after the break I'll go over some examples whatever the time allows. Professor? Hi, yes. Hi, uh, do we have time to go over the chapter 13 again? Because it makes me confused sometimes. Yeah, I actually highlighted, um, it's interesting that you say that because I actually highlighted a few questions that we hadn't covered in chapter 13 on the handout that I wanted to try to cover today. It's actually going to be, it was going to be predominantly my focus today um, because I felt like that was the chapter out of the you know out of the three that we did 12 and 14 have some similarities because of amortization and 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 interest and things but 13 is like its own separate animal and there's a lot of different things going on in there is there anything in I mean I I know what I was planning to do but is there anything in particular that you want me to address when we come back from break Oh, uh, yeah, I'll tell you when we come back. Okay, to... mm -hmm. okay. so I, I have a plan here, yeah, you know, <laughs> I have big plans of supposedly all the things we'll be able to do in this like hour and a bit that we'll have left over. I know we won't be able to do everything, but tell me and I'll see how it lines up with what I was um thinking, all right? Oh, thank you, because mm -hmm. it takes a lot of time to solve, yeah. I know. I know. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. Anybody else, anything else that you wanted to bring up? Or I can give you the break to think and maybe something will strike you during the break that you wanted to ask me or that once you've had time to process all of this information, right? Um, you may you may have more questions. So why don't we do that? Why don't we break until, um, let's make it 10.33. I don't know when the clock is going to turn over. Uh, 10, approximately 10 minutes until 10.33. Uh, not 10.33. Gosh, where's my head today? 11.33. Um, and then maybe you guys have more questions. Otherwise, I was exactly what Gion was saying. I was going to try and hop back into chapter 13 because I think it's probably the place where people need the most attention. Okay, so 11.33, uh, Mdadol, I know you have a question for me for the break. Uh, anybody else, you can stick around if you have something that you want to tell me during the break, okay? I'll pause the, the recording for now. Mdadol, are you still around? One later when they're doing the homework get rid of this thing. All right, so I guess we don't have the same um, numbers, but I can walk us through the question and then you tell me maybe where you're stuck. And if it doesn't work with my example, I can also have you share your screen and we can talk about your example, okay? Yeah, the question is like, how do, uh, how do you get the N value? How do you get the what? N. And for the oh, in okay, yeah. So let's see. A company issued nine percent 20 year bonds with a face amount of 100 million. The market yield for bonds of similar risk and maturity is six percent. So we already know that this is going to be at a premium because it's um the interest on the on this bond is is more than the market interest is paid semi annually, so it's twice a year for 20 years. So n is going to be 40. At what price do the bonds sell? You're asking me why is N for or oh, what is N? N is 40. Like it's how? Like, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's fine. Do you see here that it's 20 years that this bond is going to be for? Right? You see that? Bond? Yes. And semi-annually means they pay interest twice a year. So you get N by saying 20 years times two payments so 40 40 mm -hmm. this is a i think i did something like this on monday you can also go back to that example if it will help so in if it's a semi-annual let me give you a, a hint here 
If it's a semi-annual interest payment, which most of these are, except sometimes installment notes, if it's a semi-annual payment, then N number of periods will always be two times the time period of the bond or the term of the bond, as we call it. Twice. So two times 20 is 40. I get it. And, so M, and M will be the same for the principal and the interest. Even though the principal is only paid back once at the end, you use, do you see here, you use N, it's, it's the present value of an ordinary annuity, and you use N40 for the interest, and then the present value of $1, you still use N equals 40, even though the principal just gets paid back at the end. Yes. And then you use the 40 to find in the bond to get a uh, three point uh, three zero six five six. Yeah, so basically you have to, when you're trying to do this present valuing, you need N, the number of periods, you also need an interest rate. You always use the market rate as the interest rate for this calculation. But because this is always an annual rate, just like this is an annual rate, and interest is paid semi-annually, you have to divide the 6% by two and use 3% because it's gonna be 3% for every period, right? That they're getting. So then you use the table that shows you N is 40 at 3%. So you're gonna to go to um, present value of an annuity. I don't know what happens when you click this. Okay. Um, so you're going to go present value of an ordinary annuity. You're going to look for 3% and you're going to go down to 40 periods. And then that's the present value factor. How's that? Or did I confuse you further? I'm a like, little confused to get the point in the present value. Okay, so do you see this 2311477 that they're using as the present value factor? Yes. The interest that is being paid is considered an ordinary annuity. Okay, that's just the definition of it. They want you to get the present value of that ordinary annuity. In order to do that, you use you have to use the table for present value of an annuity, which is this PVA, okay, of $1. To find the present value factor to give you your answer, you have to know what's the interest rate and you have to know the number of um, time periods, right, in. So I don't know if you're doing your thing at the same time as me, but if you click on this PVA of $1, you come out to this table. Do you see the table? Yes. Okay. Now go, do you see a 3%? That's the interest rate we're working with. Uh -huh. And it's 40, four zero periods. So 3% for 40 periods gives you a present value factor of 23.11477. Yeah, I got the 40, uh, the 40 thing. Like I'm just like a little confused of the three uh, person. Just a little confused of three person. So you have so to like divide six to a two. And yeah, because, then, uh, because the rule here is that in order to do this calculation, you have to use the market rate. And yes, 6% is an annual rate. That's standard. Any rate that's being quoted here is an annual rate. So because our interest is semi-annual, meaning twice a year, and you have you know, this twice yearly payments to get you to 40, you have to say six divided by two so that you know how much interest is paid for every year. I see, I got it right now, thank you. Okay. I got it. And it's the same 3% for the present value of $1, which is the table that you use for the principal, right? It's, Notice that this is a completely different number because you have to go to present value of $1, that table, you look for 3% and you go down to 40. And this is the number that you use for the present valuing of the principal. Yes. Okay. Okay, so what, what's the takeaway? One, the N is dependent on the number of years of the bond and whether the interest is paid semi-annually, right? So it's 20 years, semi-annual, 20 times two is 40. The, the interest rate that you use for the present value factor is not this 9%, you use the market rate, which is 6%, but 6% is an annual rate. 
And because you're busy with semi-annual interest, you have to divide it by two to get to 3%. You have to be consistent to use the same N and the same interest for both the interest and the principal. And the tables, be very careful. The table for the interest is the present value of an annuity. The table for the principal is the present value of $1. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Sorry, I'll be right back. Okay, so it's 11.33, um, so we're going to come back on, uh, just bear with me, randomly, uh, someone from UPS needs to pick up a package at my house, but for some reason is trying to call to confirm the address, and um, they may call in this time, and I'll have to answer, although I don't know why they're confirming the address when I've already given it to them. So just um, bear with me if I if I have to pause for a second to, to make sure that they can find me. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to say, you know, Embedul was just asking about uh, this, how to calculate the, the price of this bond. Please make sure that you are just like him for those, I, th I think a number of people, I think seven or more people have already submitted the homework, but for those who are still busy, make sure that you know exactly how this process works. Because remember, I was telling you that um, in, pardon me, in uh, the last exercise or the exercise related to chapter 14, in order to start the, the exercise, you'll have to calculate the, the price of, of the bond. And if you can't do that, it's potentially going to throw off 
the rest of, of the exercise. So, you know, practice, I, I put a number of uh, examples for you to practice calculating, you know, the bond present value. Again, I said this during the break, but people may have been gone. The interest is based on the present value of an annuity, not an annuity due, just an ordinary annuity, present value, not future value, present value. And then the principal um, is based on the present value of $1. Please make sure you check if it's semi-annual interest, then your N becomes twice the number of years and your um, discount rate or your interest rate is always the market rate. Uh, in this case, it's 6%, but that's annual. So you have to divide by two to get to a semi-annual interest rate. All right. This It's a very methodical way of, of doing, um, you know, this. It's, it's very methodical. And once you get it, it's always the same. But in order to get it, you have to practice a number of times. All right. So, uh, Gion, I know that you said you may have um, something, some question or something after the break. If you do, that's great. If you don't, that's also okay because I have my own stuff that I can do. Let me know. Well, it, it's about warranties. Um, okay. Thirteen. Um, chapter thirteen. Yeah, chapter thirteen, and you're you're talking about uh, warranty uh, questions, right? Such as exercise thirteen fifty, uh, from the homework. Ah, the okay, okay, okay. Okay, so why don't we just go over that? Why don't we just go over the very question? Is that okay? To the homework question. Yeah, that would be great. Mm -hmm. No problem. Just let me stop the share for a second because I got kicked out of um, I got kicked out of Connect, so I have to sign back in. Are you, did you say question 13? Sorry, I, I may have misunderstood. Yeah. Okay, got it, gotcha. And so, so um, interestingly enough, this question is the same as number 20 on our chapter 13 handout, which was actually one of the questions that I flagged <laughs> to do with you guys. So, um, so it's basically the same question. So I'm glad that we are, I guess, in sync um this this answer is something that i wanted to do anyway and this is also uh you know a review for people who did this for homework or the i think there's like five people or so who didn't do the chapter 13 homework this is just to let you know what was happening in there okay so let me read this this is about warranties everybody um and warranties uh are a an example of a loss contingency just as we can all get onto the same page here. They're an example of a loss contingency. So, you know, the depending on what the company is warranting or guaranteeing, they have to create some type of liability um, in order to show that there's, you know, going to be a future settlement of, of some sort, whatever that settlement may be. All right, so let's read it. Coppola Awning Corporation introduced a new line of commercial uh, awnings in 2021 that carry a two-year warranty against manufacturer's defects. So it's a manufactured warranty, right? Based on the experience uh, with previous product introduction, introductions, excuse me, warranty costs are expected at approximately 2% of uh, sales. So when we went over this in class, I was saying that um, the way you know, when you talk about can it be reasonably estimated and is it probable, right, when you think about a contingent loss or contingent liability, um, th this, this warranty falls right into the definition of that because the fact that they can predict that about 2% of, um, of this, these awnings will come back or will have some type of warranty cost attached to them um, means that it is probable that there will be some type of event right the, to to make that liability happen and it can also be reasonably estimated and I'm speaking about this because the first question of this homework is asking does the situation represent a loss contingency you know and it does because there's a liability that's dependent on a, a future event and not only does it um, or potential liability that is dependent on a future event to kind of clarify whether it will be a liability. But only, not only that, 
it's actually, you know, you will have to journalize it because it is probable and there is a reasonable um, estimate. So sales and actual warranty expenditures for the first year of selling the product were sales of 5,340,000. This is my amount. I think this is an algorithmic question. So you guys may have different amounts. The actual warranty expenditures for the year were 49,500. Does the situation represent a loss contingency? So this is what I was just talking about. The answer is yes. If you're still um, you know, concerned with what is a loss contingency, obviously it's in the textbook, but also um, here, yeah, right? Contingent liability. It's, it's, a, it's a liability that's dependent on the occurrence of one or more future events, right? To confirm whether it, it will be paid, et cetera. So you just had to choose between yes or no, and the answer is yes. Are we okay so far? And if anybody has something to add or, or ask, just ask. Prepare journal entries that summarize sales of the awnings, assume all our credit sales, we're just saying debit accounts receivable, and any aspects of the warranty that should be recorded during 2021. So this is annoying because they don't really tell you exactly um, what <laughs> to record. They just say aspects of the warranty, but we already know that we have to create a 2% liability. And we also know that there are actual warranty expenditures that we will have to journalize. Right. So requirement number two, here we go. The sales, debit accounts receivable 5,340,000. Credit sales revenue 5,340,000. The warranty liability that we are going to um, get the calculator. The warranty liability that we will have to uh, create is going to be 2%, right? We saw it already in the question, 2% of the sales number. So 5,340,000 times 2%. So 106,800. So there's the journal entry to recognize the liability because remember it is probable and it can be reasonably estimated. Your debit warranty expense 106,800 and your credit warranty liability 106,800. Questions up to there. You just see, I can't see if anybody's raising their hand. Okay. Then they tell you that there are actual warranty expenditures that have already been incurred during the year. So you have to account for those. And the way you do that is you decrease the liability by the amount that you've already paid, 49,500, and you pay out cash. So you credit cash, 49,500. Okay, so those are the sales entries and the warranty um, related entries. Now the question becomes what amount should Capola report as a liability at December 31, right? So what happened um, in December? You created a liability of 106,800, right? As a, a result of having to recognize the, the warranty. You decreased that liability by 49,500. So that means that your remaining liability should be 57,300. There's no other you know, liability amounts that are happening in this question. So my hope is that when I click on here, the answer is 57,300. Again, it's the beginning balance of the liability, which is 106,800. The, the warranty liability that has already been fulfilled to the tune of 49,500, when you subtract that from the 106,800, you get to 57,300 as the liability that remains. Gion follow-up questions or clarifications? So far, good. Thank you. Okay. Anything else on this question or on another question? On this homework, anybody? I mean, it's a, it's a free for all. I'll move to questions that I want to do, but I'm happy to answer something that is, is more pressing for the, um, for the class. This is not about me. Okay, so I'll, I'll stay in chapter 13. Think about whether you have other questions. I'm gonna stay in chapter 13 and I'm gonna go to um, a question about uh, also contingencies, contingent liabilities. Um, 
and it is number 13 on the handout. I can't remember if I also made it a homework question. You guys can tell me. But I, I just want to go again through kind of the, the thinking about when a contingent liability should be journalized or not. Because remember, I told you in the exam, one of the questions is going to be around whether you need to make journal entries or not. So let's go to this uh, number 13. Yeah, in, in chapter 13, let me just stop the share for a second and pull up the chapter 13 classwork um, document so that when we do when we do the work um, you actually have it So let's look at exercise 13. Where am I if you're lost as to what we're doing? I am in chapter 13, which was about current liabilities and contingencies. I'm on, you know, near the end of, of the chapter where we had all the exercises. And I'm specifically looking at this example 13, which we had not covered together when we were, we did other things that were similar when we were going through the chapter, but um, this one you won't find. Um, you know, an answer somewhere in your notes. And I will do the answer though on the chapter 13 workings document. So let's read this together. Household solutions, manufactures, kitchen storage products, right? During the year, the company became aware of potential costs due to one, a recently filed lawsuit for patent infringement. So patent infringement, someone's trying to say that um, household is, is you know, creating products that are uh, protected by a patent of, of another company that they shouldn't be able to, to make those products for which the probability, see here how this language works, the probability of loss is remote. So we already know, uh, um, that remote means that you don't make a journal entry and you don't do any footnote disclosure. But then it says, and damages can be reasonably estimated. So that might be a little bit confusing if you read this because you're like, wait, you can estimate it. So shouldn't we maybe journalize it since we can estimate it? The answer is no, okay? Please remember that the only time you make a journal entry is if it is probable and you can estimate the amount right, of the liability. To do footnote disclosure, it needs to be reasonably possible that you would have the loss, okay? And to, for remote, as soon as you see that it's remote, you basically are, are done. There's nothing else to be, to be done, even if the amount can be estimated. So moving, and I'll, I'll write these answers out in a minute. I'm, I'm actually, if you can believe it, we're still only reading the question. Another recently filed lawsuit for food contamination by the plastics used in household solutions products for which loss is, there's the key words, right? Probable, but the amount of loss, what does it say? Cannot be reasonably estimated. So now what do we do? Right, so probable is is higher than reasonably possible. So if it's probable, but it can't be um, reasonably estimated, you cannot make a journal entry because what amount are you going to use in the journal entry? Right, that's that's not a, a thing. You won't be able to make a journal entry, but you will probably have to do footnote disclosure to say that there's a probable loss, but you're not yet able to. Um, estimate the amount and I'll write it out for you. I'm just showing you that the way these questions can be written, you know, can make them, I guess, somewhat confusing uh, in that you, you know, end up thinking that maybe because it's probable you'll have to make a journal entry even if you can't estimate the amount. 
Number three, a new product warranty that, that is probable. So there's the warranties again, right? Remember I told you your warranties are contingent loss. Probable and can be reasonably estimated. So there we meet both criteria, right? Which if any of these costs should be accrued and by accrued, they mean making a journal entry, right? To, um, to record the liability. So, so it's only gonna be number three that will have to be accrued. So let me go in here. And so we say for number one, the, this is, or I'll just say this is remote or the possibility, let me put, let me think of a better wording to say this. The possibility of a contingent liability is remote. So no journal, right? No journal entry and no footnote disclosure, even though we can estimate the amount. It just doesn't matter. Okay. So no journal entry for number one. Number two, we go back, right? Number two said that it's probable and it cannot be reasonably estimated. So the loss is probable, but because it cannot be reasonably estimated, we do not make a journal entry. Footnote disclosure will likely be made since the loss is probable. Stop me again if you have questions, all right? I'm going through Making, I don't know if, if anybody or asking the chat. Then the last one is the loss. Oh, this is probably sorry. It's the things are slip. The loss is probable and can be reasonably estimated. So a journal entry is. Entry is required. It seems like it. I don't think this is autocorrect. I think it's my fingers are just used to typing certain words and not others. Um, <clears throat> so in this case, you know, this question looks very dense when you look at it initially. It looks like, ah, you know, what's going on? It's a little bit crazy. But if you pull it apart, you start to see that, um, you know, the only scenario where journal entry is needed is uh, number three. Okay, guys, so that's anything else in, again, I, I, can, I can jump. I wanted to do, um, I did want to do a question in, in chapter 12 because I feel like we, we were in that chapter, you know, a very long time ago. But um, I'm also curious to hear if anybody has a question, uh, anybody got stuck on something to do with the homework that is due today, that's chapter 14, or if you have other questions. Um, related to chapter 14. Otherwise, I'll go into chapter 12. All right, you think about it. Um, if you have something that you, you want to ask me in... Um, in chapter 14, I just thought that it might be useful to at least do one, maybe, I don't know, one, maybe two 
questions, um, not the bond so much, but the stock questions in chapter 12, because I feel like, you know, in chapter 14, we did a little bit of the bond types, you know, things, even though it was looking from the borrower's perspective, but the chapter 12 investments, uh, you know, the, the fair value through net income, you know, I think we were all kind of okay with it when we when you were doing it, but um, but that was a long time ago, right? So I thought it might be helpful to at least just go through one of these uh, questions as as an example and and remind everybody of you know what what it is that we are doing. Um, I see someone's connecting. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the support <laughs> because I'm like, you know, is everybody just okay with everything? Because no one is, is, is saying anything. <laughs> or maybe so everybody's like, what the heck is going on? When did we even do this? I, I don't remember this. <laughs> I know what it's like to be a student, even though I'm much older. I, yeah, I remember, yeah, I remember like sometimes you're like, what? I Was I awake for that? Do, do I remember that? Like it's it's been ages ago. So let's do this equity. You know, this was my plan to to kind of um, knock out some stuff in 13 to and then to reverse right back to 12 and, and make sure that people are, are aware of, of what I'm saying. All right. So I'm looking at a, a, a question in, in the textbook. Um, you know, it's we've we've kind of run into this stuff before, but uh, exercise twelve dash sixteen. You know, if you want to look in your own textbook or just follow along with me, I'll just pull up a a clean um a clean Excel spreadsheet. Or actually, better yet, you know, I will I will go into the chapter twelve class workings um spreadsheet and and do the answer there so that when anybody's looking at this, you know, you, you basically have, you have access. I mean, you have access to the answer, I think anyway, but it may have been similar to a more question, but I'm gonna do it, yeah. All right, I'm gonna share my screen again. Excuse me. Okay, so let's read it and see what's happening. Um, on January the 2nd, 2021, Sanborn Tobacco Inc. bought 5% of Jackson Industry Capital stock. So the 5%, oh yeah, I forgot this thing always does this. The 5% tells you that you are in uh, the realm of uh, equity investments with fair value through net income. Remember the equity investments have three, um, I guess there's three categories of them. There's owning less than 20%, which is a fair value through net income. There's a 20 to 50% significant influence, which is the equity method. And then there's more than 50%, which is consolidation. And as I've said before, we don't have to do anything with consolidation. You just need to know um, that that exists. In this case, the 5% tells you that this company is gonna be fair value through net income, right? Because they own less than 20%. Um, they bought it for 90 million. So they, I'm doing this again. They bought it for 90 million. So there's your purchase price. Jackson Industries net income for the year ended December 31, 2021 was 120 million. So the questions will always test you and I'll call it testing as opposed to trick you. They'll test to see if you understand that when it's fair value through net income, you do not include any portion of the of the com of the investee, right? The company that you invested in, you don't include any portion of their net income in your books. Okay, that's you only do that when you're doing the equity method. So please beware of that, right? This 120 million is not going to be recorded. We only record dividend uh, revenue if if there is any. And I'll show you when I do the journal entries. The fair value of the shares held by Sanborn was 98 million at December 31. So we, we can see immediately that we have an $8 million um, dollar increase, right, in fair value. Uh, during January, I mean, sorry, during 2021, Jackson declared a dividend of 60 million. So there's the dividend. Now, be careful with the dividend. It says that they declared a dividend of 60 million. You don't get the whole dividend. You're only going to get 5% 
of 60 million. These are the types of things, you know, when we're in a test and we're getting all um, flustered or worked up or trying to save time or whatever that we may overlook. So, you know, multiply your 60 million by 5%. Prepare all appropriate journal entries related to the investment during 2021. Typical way that they ask this question because they want to not give away the fact that you shouldn't um, record net income. They want to see if you know that. And then, of course, um, yeah, uh, the next thing, and we've seen this before, assume that the stock is sold, right, on January the 2nd, 2022, 410 million. So you can see already that between, I guess, this last day of 21 and the next uh, two days, the stock price shot up. So there's going to be another fair value adjustment before we do um, the sale. So I'm going to take you step by step through the starting with the purchase of the investment. I somehow have ended up on a different tab. Um, I think it was when I was moving something around. That's fine. Um, all right. So let me close this out. We don't need it right now. Let's go here. Okay. So the first thing that we're going to do is the purchase, right? The purchase of the investment. And it's uh, journal entries. And if you recall, it's kind of inconvenient how this thing is here, but anyway, if you recall, the investment costs 90 million, right? So, <clears throat> so I'm going to debit my investment in equity securities or equity investment, depending on, you know, I think the book is more into investment in equity securities, 90 million. I have to shift this across, sorry, because I didn't leave the space for the credit. And the credit is cash for you know in the absence of any further information this looks a little bit awkward okay so that's the purchase of uh the investment i will um put here record net income just to remind us that there is no journal entry okay only record net income for equity method investments, which is 20 to 50% with significant influence. So no net income. Report dividends, that, that is um, something that we will do, right? Record the dividend, yes. I'll bring this down since we had some writing in between. Okay, so what are we going to do with the dividend? We're receiving the dividend in cash. The dividend is 60 million total, but we have to do 5%, right? So 60 times 5%, 3. And dividend revenue. Another 3. Right, and then we come to the fair value adjustment. I don't know what's going on here with the with this all. I don't know. Everything looks like it's coming from different places. So, fair value adjustment, <clears throat> right, is the is the next piece. So remember what you're trying to do here, and just to go back to the question, what you're trying to do here is to compare the cost and the fair value. And obviously if the fair value is greater than the cost, then um, you have a gain. In this case, we have a gain. And we're going to use that account called fair value adjustment, um, you know, as part of the transaction to record the gain. So I'll just write over here on the side, right? Gain or loss, question mark. And I'll say, what is the fair value? So it's 98. What is the cost is 90. So there's a gain coming out here of eight. And this, remember the, the um, 
the fair value adjust, they just bought this, um, they just bought this investment. So the, the fair value adjustment account has a zero beginning balance for this particular um, investment. I think that's you know also important to know. This this will be this will be the ending balance on the fair value adjustment account. But and I'll I'll just review the fair value adjustment account here with you also, right? In for a penny, in for a pound, let's just do it all. Um, so fair value adjustment, same uh, debits and credits, right? Same increase and decrease as the actual investment up on the debit, down on the credit. And for this particular, and, and you can go back, you'll see we did all this stuff before, but you know, for this particular example, there's a zero balance to begin with because um, we, we didn't own this investment before to, to have a, a balance left over. This is gonna be a debit balance of eight because when the fair value is, is greater than the cost, it's a debit balance, okay? So the adjustment is gonna be also a debit to fair value adjustment. So let me just write this here. Um, debit balance when fair value is greater than cost, right? And this is kind of just the rules that maybe will help you to know which way the, the journal entry goes. And it's a credit balance, obviously, when fair value is less than cost, All right? So at the moment, fair value is greater than cost. So we have a debit balance. So for the adjustment here, you're gonna debit fair value adjustment as we just saw for eight. And you're gonna credit gain on, remember this account, gain on investments, and then you say unrealized, and it's going through net income. And that is also eight. I'm gonna stop there and let it simmer and make sure that people are okay, or if you have questions, you can ask me. What I didn't do was put dates, which may be helpful if people are struggling to follow. So let me just do that. Although it's really just the purchase date that's different. Okay. Nevertheless, so it's January the 2nd. This is, I guess we're recording this on 1231. This is also 1231 21. No, 1231 21. One, two. Yeah, I don't know why the formatting is, is not aligned there. I just want to make a distinction between this fair value adjustment and the next one that we're going to make. Um, because now when we come to part B and we have to sell this investment, um, we'll have to update. Remember that that's the process that we go through. We update the fair value in the books and then we record the sale, all right? So over here, they're gonna sell the stock or they sold the stock for 110 million. Let me take you through the journal entries. So this is January the 2nd, 2022. Hopefully, okay, so that's, so, so we're gonna update update fair value that's the first uh, the first piece to the puzzle right so again is it you know is there a gain or a loss what's the fair value now what's the cost from before the fair value now is 110 million the cost remains 90 right
So this is clearly a gain, but this gain is, again, this will be the ending balance. So I'm, I'm doing it this long way because I know people sometimes get confused and they just will now put the 20 as the, as the adjustment or just say, oh, fair value went up by, you know, to 110. What's the difference between um, that and what we paid for it? So 20 is our adjustment, but it's not our adjustment because we've already made an adjustment for eight before, remember? So the way you want to think about it is, I guess, if you just bring this, um, this fair value adjustment account down here, this might be too long-winded. Maybe you already understand what's going to happen. That's fine. But I'm just being very kind of systematic so that people don't get lost. So the what we have now is a beginning balance of 8 million, right, from the previous year. And we need um, an ending balance of 20 based on the work that we just did, right? The, the 20 is going to be the ending balance. So 20. So obviously, the adjustment is going to be 12, right? It's just going to be 20 minus the eight that is already there. So it's a debit of 12 and the credit once again will go to, let me try doing this right. The credit will go to the gain account. So you're going to say um, fair value adjustment 12 and then gain gain on investments. Again, unrealized because you're doing this before you do the sale or record the sale. Unrealized net income. And that's the 12. Questions, anyone? Professor? Mm -hmm. Sorry, how can I access this uh, spreadsheet? It's the same spreadsheet from what we used in chapter 12. You will go to chapter Zoom, 12? Mm -hmm. Zoom notes and examples. I'm... And you go over here. It's the same spreadsheet. Chapter 12? Mm -hmm. yeah. The same I... spreadsheet. You just scroll down and you'll see I had, you know, we, the last thing we did was example 14. This is the next thing. Yes, I think I cannot see <laughs> the solutions. Let me see what's going on. Maybe, maybe it's not anyone with link. Let me put the link in the mm -hmm. chat. Mm -hmm. How about that? Try now. There's a link in the chat. I see, is this you? Anonymous raccoon. Right now I can see, thank okay. you so much. I think um, it's possible that this link, let me just do this now before this becomes a, a continued issue. Um, it's possible that the, because yeah, it's possible that maybe the link wasn't available to everybody, I don't know. Although people seem to be following it while I was teaching them theory, whatever. As long as you're in, you're in, right? Okay, so, so I updated the, um, the fair value now. So we know that uh, we have this gain and now we have to do the sale, okay? And it's on the same date. So we'll just do the journal entry for the sale of the investment. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the, the question, it says, right, that it was sold for 110 million. Remember the cost is 90, 90, 90 million. So all you have to do now is record your cash of 110. You're going to get rid of the investment in equity securities at 90, right, the original cost. And then you're going to remove the balance in your fair value adjustment account, the full balance, 20. I probably shouldn't have uh, skipped a line. Yeah, I'll just put it here in case you guys think something's missing. So that's how you do the journal entry. So I guess the way, the preferred way to do this is instead of 
having um, a journal entry for the sale where part of, of the you know, the journal entry is the old fair value adjustments, and then you're somehow doing the update to the fair value within the sale entry. The approach is to first update the fair value to whatever the selling price is, and then do the journal entry for the sale of the investment afterwards. And when you do that, the balance that is on your fair value adjustment account is going to be eliminated as part of. Um, the selling of the investment, the sales journal entry, the investment balance obviously will also be eliminated and the cash that you receive will be recognized as a debit. I'll let it simmer here for, you know, 30 seconds to a minute and ask me any questions. All right, so yeah, any more thoughts, comments, questions? Yeah, so I'll let this sit here for a, a minute for people to just review. Um, the next thing we'll do is 12.19. Um, so for those who are looking at the textbook, I'm gonna do 12-19. Okay, so we'll leave it there. Let's look at um, 12, 19. I'm gonna see if I can somehow, doesn't look like I can bring this thing back to the other tab. So I'll just work off two tabs, it's fine. Um, <clears throat> all right, so the, the point here with 12-19 is, is I guess another go around with um, the investments less than, uh, or I guess 20%, but no significant influence. But I'm actually interested in more in part two, which is uh, the, the significant influence piece, which is the, is the equity method. So um, I'm going to read this and then I'm gonna do the, the part two first so that you can see equity method accounting again to remind everybody how that goes and if we need to, if we feel like it, we can do part one as well. So I repeat, I'm just going to do part two first and maybe we'll leave it at, at that. But um, this question is, is basically, you know, uh, covering both investments through uh, fair value through net income and equity investments. All right, so let me start reading here. As a long-term investment, Painters Equipment purchased 20% of AMC Supplies Inc.'s 400,000 shares for 480,000 
at the beginning of uh, the fiscal year of both companies. So already you have to be careful here with you know what they're saying about what was purchased because um, it's 20% of 400,000 shares. So if there is something to do with dividends and they give you dividends as an amount per share, you have to know how many shares uh, were actually purchased. All right. And, you know, I mean, we can do this math. It's, it's, it's not a problem. So where am I? On the purchase date, the fair value and book value of AMC's net assets were equal. So they're just trying to say there's no adjustments needed um, when doing the equity method. I'm not testing you on making um, adjustments for like uh, the differences in fair value and net um, and book value on the assets that would cause differences in depreciation and so on. We're not going to cover that. Assume that you your fair value and book value for equity method will be the same. During the year, AMC earned net income of 250000 and distributed cash dividends of 25 cents per share. So there's the thing that, that we were talking about before, right? That you have to know the number of shares that they own because now your dividend is a per share amount as opposed to a dollar amount. At year end, the fair value of the shares is 505,000. When you're doing equity method and you didn't do the fair value option, the, the fair value of the, of the shares is irrelevant um, under equity method. Um, because you're not going to be fair valuing that investment. So again, we're looking at this, assume significant influence was acquired. So you have 20% plus significant influence. So that definitely is equity method. Prepare the appropriate journal entries for the purchase through the end of the year. So just to remind people, um, let me see here, where we are in the material when we're looking at a question like this. I'm referring to this holdings of 20 to 50% with significant influence. That's the equity method. This is for chapter 12 equity investments. If you don't want to look at it over there, I'll go into, let me see if I can just open the book here again, or if it's going to tell me that I already have it open somewhere else. All right, it's fine. Um, yeah, it's, it's basically going to the same thing. Nevertheless, let me just show you, if you don't look at the notes, that's fine, but then you can also find the same information over here, right? Accounting for equity investment. And it actually gives you a whole heap of information, right? About what to do. If you don't have significant influence, their value through net income have significant influence, 20 to 50% equity method. This is where we are. All right, so now, of, of course, because the system is, I don't want to say the system is ganging up on me, but it feels like it. Uh, I've now lost my, my place because it won't let me open more than one thing at a time. All right, so... Nevertheless, this is the question, and I will go in and uh, do equity method uh, part two, right, of, of the question equity method. So exercise 12-19 uh, is where we're at, and we're doing number two. Just to be very clear when you're looking at this. And so the first thing is the purchase of the investment. Let me just put this a little bit lower so these things are not on top of each other. Okay, so the purchase of the investment for this one, you say investment in, remember I told you you could say equity invest equity investment with a company name. I know that the book prefers to say investment in equity affiliate, so I'm just going to stick with the language. And if you want to know the purchase price going back, they bought it for 480000 sorry, 480000 So that's what we'll do. And then it's cash, right? Cash on the credit side. 
So there's that, then it's recording net income. So unlike the previous example, right, where I told you that we do not include net income, um, we will record net income for equity investments, equity method investments. Let me show you here. Remember for the previous one, we said no journal entry. We only owned 5% of the investment year. We will have to record net income. And so we go back to the question and I know that it went away a little bit, that's fine. Um, let's look and see. They earned net income of 250,000. So we still have to apply our 20% to the 250,000. So let's go and do that. And the journal entries, remember, for, for the net income are maybe a little bit strange, but we explained why this is the case. You increase the balance of the investment for your portion of the net income, and it's going to be 250,000 times 20%, right? Yeah, 50,000. And then you also recognize on the credit side, investments revenue. Remember nothing has been paid in cash, so there's no cash, uh, you know, debiting cash or anything like that. You're just recognizing the revenue that is attributable to your investment in this company. Now you're gonna to have to record the dividends. So again, a difference here with equity method versus fair value through net income investments for the dividend, the dividend is actually going to reduce your investment balance. Because remember, what is a dividend? It's just net income that's being distributed, right? So since you added all the net income onto your balance, when some of that net income is being distributed, you know, to you, you will have to decrease your balance. So with the dividends, remember you, we said that um, we will have to check how many shares we actually own. So we'll have to say 20% of 400,000 shares and multiply that number by 25 cents a share. That's, that's how you do the dividend number. So I'll write it out over here. So it's going to be a debit to cash. It's going to be 20% multiplied by 400,000 shares. And that number is multiplied by 0.2525 cents. Stop me at any time if you're not following. So 400,000 shares times 20% times 0.2525 cents. So 20,000 is the dividend cash. And then again, the credit doesn't go to dividend revenue, but it goes to investment in equity affiliate. So you put in 50,000 and of that 50,000, you've already received 20,000. Okay, that's, that's basically what we're saying here. So there's still 30,000 of net income that is included in the investment balance. Um, that hasn't been distributed yet. And then the last thing that we should address, even though you know we already know that it's irrelevant, there is a fair value amount at the end of the year. There's obviously been an increase in fair value. So do we account for that or not? And the answer is no, okay? For, for the equity method, this can get very confusing. So you, so you have to... Um, I'm not sure what I'm doing here. Sorry, guys. Um, you have to make sure that you study this. This can get very confusing. The fair value adjustment is made for um, the, you know, the holdings that are not equity method, just general uh, uh, securities. But yeah, for equity method, there is no fair value adjustment for the equity method investment. Okay, there's just no, there's no fair value adjustment. So even though that information is given to you, you don't actually need to record it. Again, I'll let this simmer for a bit and see if anybody um, has 
some clarification question or something that you need to, to talk about further. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is just finish out this question completely by also doing number one. I front loaded number two because I wanted to make sure that I covered equity method investments with you guys again. But um, you know, just to give some additional practice on, on the investments that are um, pay value through net income, I will do this item number one. And then I guess we'll we'll almost be at time. And if there's something else that someone prefers me to talk about, uh, you know, I'll be happy to do that as well. You can tell me in the chat, and I can also stick around at the end of the class if you have more questions. But <clears throat> item number one says that assume that no significant influence was acquired. So they're testing to see if you understand the theory behind this you know, this setup as well. If even though we bought 20% of this company, which makes it seem like it should be an equity method investment, we have to also have significant influence for it to truly be an equity method investment. I'll go back to, um, back to the notes to remind you of that. I have so many things open, so um, I have to make sure that I'm going to the right place. So going back to the notes, right? That's 20, uh, less than 20% fair value through uh, net income. If it's 20 to 50%, but with significant influence, then it will be the equity method. So what's happening in this in the example is that it is a 20% investment, but there's no significant influence. So this means that we will have to do um, fair value through net income as the approach for accounting for this investment. And I'll write that down um, in, our, in our work over here. So this is gonna be number one. So it's no significant influence, so fair value through net income approach. And so I'll take you through every step again of, of and you'll see that this is gonna be similar to 1216, although there's no sale of the investment, but it's, it's, a, it's a similar um, approach. So, we're gonna do the purchase of the investment and so on, right? Every, basically every step with, with a different um, mindset now, given that we don't have, um, we don't have significant influence. So purchase of the investment, it's not investment. I know it's, it's a very small difference, but it's not an investment in an equity affiliate anymore. It's just going to be investment in equity securities, all right? So there's already something that you want to take note of because we're not doing equity method, but the amount is the same, obviously. And then cash, that's known. Okay, so notice how, how these are, are differing from each other. Now, when it comes to recording net income, what do you think I'm gonna say here? No journal entry for net income because this is not an equity method investment. This is the same like uh, exercise 12-16 where they also told us there was net income but we didn't do anything about it because we're not allowed to record um, net in our portion of net income when we don't have significant influence because we have no say over when or how the company distributes the net income. So we can't act as if it's attributable to us. 
Now we come to recording dividends. Just tell me if you need me to slow down. I'm not trying to rush out of this. I, I'm just, you know, I'm not getting much complaint. So I'm assuming people are still with me. The cash is the same, okay? The cash, it's still gonna be, it's exactly the same. It's the 20% holding times the 400,000 shares, right? Times the 25 cents, same story, okay? So you've got a dividend of 20,000, but watch the, watch the credit. It's not the investment, it's going to be, just like the previous example, 12, 16, it's dividend revenue. Right. So there's another difference. This is also a difference. I should have made this in red, although seeing all this writing in red might be a little bit jarring. And now the fair value adjustment, right? What's happening there? Definitely there will be a fair value adjustment, right? So we say is there a gain or loss? Well, what is the fair value? What is the cost? And let's check, okay? So the fair value is five, I believe it's 505,000. The cost was 480,000. You don't have to go to a per share number or anything. You can just use these two numbers. Fair value is clearly higher than cost. So there's going to be a gain. So 505,000 and 480,000. Twenty-five thousand gain. This is the ending balance on fair value adjustment. But remember, since this investment was just bought, the beginning balance on fair value adjustment is zero. So the journal entry will be for 25,000. We don't have to do, I mean, you can do a T account if you want to, but you'll just find out that, that the adjustment is 25,000, right? I'm not gonna do the T account again. I did it with you already. So we debit fair value adjustment. And how do I know I debit it? Because fair value is greater than cost. So it's a plus, right? In the fair value adjustment account, 25,000. Or if you don't know how to think through that, remember gain is always a credit. And maybe we need to say that, right? The gain will be a credit. A loss is a debit. And the fair value adjustment is just on the other side for the journal entry to, to balance. So gain on investments. All right, unrealized, this is going through net income and 25,000. So, so this is all uh, different from, from the previous, the equity method, right? That we actually do have an adjustment um, for fair value. So again, let's take a pause here and make sure that people are okay. All right, so that's the end of the, the question. And we don't have much time left. We have about five minutes left. So I'm not gonna jump into another question. Um, 
I guess I'll leave this time for open for people who maybe have um, things that they want to ask me or clarify questions about either what we just did or even on the homework or, or something like that. I'll leave it open. And um, if not, I, you know, I wish you well. It's been really lovely to, to spend time with you guys this semester to teach you. And um, I hope that you have learned something. That's, that's my aim, right? And that you'll have more than enough time to, to study. I'm still contactable, obviously. Um, and you can you can contact me to ask questions about the exam. I'm still busy marking uh, term papers in that, you know, it's it's an ongoing process. So I'm trying to turn them around as quickly as I can. And so please do look out for uh, emails from me showing, you know, sending a sheet that tells you how you've been graded for the term paper. Um, I'll probably ask you in the email to just confirm that you've received it. This is, you know, the challenge that we have with um, not meeting in person. I can't give you your paper back, but I will give you a comprehensive document stating how I graded your work. Okay, so again, you're dismissed. Um, if you don't have any questions for me, all the deadlines have been discussed tomorrow. I'll, I'll you know, I'll still be available if people need help with anything to do with the e-portfolio or with this work. Um, otherwise, go and have a lovely day and I maybe we'll see each other around somewhere at some point, I don't know, um, but it was good to spend time with you guys.